Welcome and bienvenue, konnichiwa. It's time for the Arms Inquisition yet again, episode 176 on Sunday the 21st of March. I'm Armish Phil. I'm Armish Ben. And I'm Armish Ben. And tonight's guest is an author, metaphysical healer and near-death experience survivor. Uh, you can find her books at maryhelenhensley.com. Link in the description in the show notes as always. Welcome to the show, Mary. Hey, can I be Amish Mary? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, okay. we'll... I'm changing my name. We'll fix it in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were just saying you were in Ireland. How on earth did you... Um... And Amish Yoda. Amish. Uh... Got Amish Groku as well. Um, now then, we were just saying before, <laughs> obviously I can detect a southern twang, a southern American twang in your accent, but you're actually in, in Ireland currently. How did uh, How did you get over in Ireland? That's right. But I'm probably the one who's closest to anything resembling anything Amish in this whole group. <laughs> I've eaten more Amish sweet bread. What's that? That's right, because we have Amish where I come from. But anyway, um, oh, Amish sweet bread, it's like this kind of, oh, don't even get me started. Um, how did I get to Ireland? I'm chasing ancient symbols. Oh, right. So is this um, sort of right. Celtic mythology kind of stuff? Um, well, n- no, <laughs> kind of st- <laughs> stuff that happened after the near-death experience. And, you know, I started seeing these symbols and, uh, oh. this is usually the long answer to the, Hey, did you marry an Irish guy? And I'm like, eh, no. <laughs> um, yeah. So no, I started seeing these symbols. Um, they were a collection of pre-Atlantean, symbols um that i have found in different spots all over the world and some of them happen to be here in ireland and then i came here and i liked ireland ireland liked me and then i stayed right hey one of the ancient i'll tell you what mary one of your ancient symbols it wasn't this sort of hourglass with the dots on either side was it yeah that's sort of, one of them yeah it's, it's sort of this ancient symbol that they keep finding in cave paintings and on ancient pottery and it, it's something to do with like plasma Discharges in the atmosphere, from what I've read, uh, the man thing. Yeah, yeah. that's what right. I'm... So basically, what they are is they're they're holographic. You know, so as we see them, they're like two D iconographs. But what they really are, um, when we say kind of pre Atlantean, so you're you're going back over thirteen thousand seven hundred and seventy four, probably seven thousand seven hundred eighty four years um, at this stage, and. Um, these would be the same as like if somebody went to someone from 1776, hey, here's this USB key and it, it has tens of thousands of words in it and volumes and pictures of things. And they're like, what? Do you know? And so these symbols um, as represented in 2D look just like a little alphabet, but holographically back in that day, it carried, you know, just a, a ton of information. And so there's an entire alphabet. It's called a Goet, G-O-T-T-E, Goet alphabet. Um, don't even go bother looking it up. It's You're not going to find it. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically in pursuit of the largest collection of them together, because there'd be some in Norway, there's some in Mexico, there's some in Ireland, there's some in Wales, you know, but never collectively together. Right. And, um, yeah, so there've been a few people who have, who've been searching for these and I'm like, I've been seeing them for years and years and years and years. And, um, so yeah, you know, that's effectively how I got here. Um, when and did... then when I got here, realized that it would be easier for me to be, be me and do me from here. Um, which is so funny because then here take, you know, took me back home and took me back into the States into places that I would have never gone um had i been living there right 
these these symbols that you're looking for in Ireland, what do they occur in? Are they in like ancient stonework or megalithic monuments? Yeah, they or? were, you know, in the, um, there were a couple of them in um, Newgrange, you know, which is a 5,000 year old um, monolithic tomb. And, um, you know, there were a couple of them there. And um, what I'm doing now, because I've collectively had all of these symbols for, you know, many, many years. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm working with different people um, in cymatics and astrophysics and uh, trying to get the, the frequencies of the symbols and unlock some of the information because basically they record history prior to, you know, over 13 and a half thousand years ago. So oh. basically before the, the last Atlantean fall, and it's so, it's so cliche when we talk about Atlantis and it's, you know, it's a cartoon, it's a Disney movie. It's a look, the very same as, you know, we're watching Venice creep underwater and in a couple of hundred years, it'll be this great place that people talk about. And, oh, my God, there was so much amazing stuff there. I mean, civilizations come and go. They're, they're above water. They're below water. You know, so the place existed. It's not like it didn't. Um, and the advances they had made technologically, it just so happens that at the time of the last major cataclysm that we saw here on Earth, um, they got it, you know. And so knowing that that was on the way, they started sending people out. So kind of emissaries um, into different parts of the world, which is why we see aspects of that in Egypt. We see it in, you know, Gobekli Tepe, you know, we see it in all different places around the world um, because, you know, it was something that they could see, you know, you have a supernova explodes. There's a couple of planets blasted in the, in the process, trash coming our way, you know, there's fire and brimstone and all sorts of fun stuff. And then, you know, basically there's a big wave. And so, the vast majority of that civilization, you know, falls victim to the earth changes because of that cataclysm. However, everybody didn't die. The whole world didn't go under there. Every single um, historical record talks about a great flood. And so there have been multiple great floods in our history. And so, you know, you can go back to the Epic of Gilgamesh 18,000 years ago. You can go back to the last fall of Atlantis 13 and a half thousand years ago. I mean, these things happen. Yeah. And so what's interesting you know, as, as that we sit here now in, in the height of, of, of our um, our glorious stupidity that we actually think we're the pinnacle of creation. And I'm going, yeah, guess what? There's always a flood. Um, so, you know, it's it's the way that this hologram is the way that, that that Earth vibe cleanses itself, starts over, resets, you know, reprograms the video game. And, um, yeah, so uh, that's one of the reasons... Um, that I'm in Ireland. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize and the that. Guinness is really Sorry, good. Go on. <laughs> go on. She just said that the was, it. was really good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I've talked to it. There's a bit of a sorry. There's a bit of slight delay between uh, hearing you and your lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, a lot of people don't realize that at the end of the last ice age, this period you're talking about, thirteen thousand years ago, sea levels were four hundred foot lower. And what do we know about people? Where did they settle? They always settle on the coasts and on the sides of, of rivers. And, uh, and, you know, most of the traces of these civilizations are now 400 feet underwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like some, you know, some great mystery. It's, it's uh, you know, it's factual. And some of these civilizations um, were quite advanced. But we, we tend to think as time marches forward that, you know, that we get smarter as we move forward. We get different, you know, and it's not it's not a straight climb up. It's, mm. it's a trajectory in, in a hundred different directions. Um, you know, where there was technology then that we don't have now. And we have technology now that we didn't have then. Um, it, it's not everybody. We get this idea that because it was in the past that these are like cavemen and, you know, the, yeah. it's just not the way it is. Yeah. We've talked about this before about how technology isn't the linear progression that we think it is. I mean, you only have to look yeah. at, at our country, the UK and the, and the fall of the Roman empire, 430, whatever it was AD. And we had these fantastic infrastructure, these aqueducts, we had houses with central heating mm -hmm. and it all just went to ruin because we didn't have the skills mm -hmm. to maintain it. And that's where we come up with the term, the dark ages. They were dark mm -hmm. because we, we went backwards. Technologically, we went back like a thousand years. Exactly. Uh, people just don't seem to comprehend this. They think it's just one way, constant progression forward. And 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, they're the ones who usually uh, bite it in the Pac Man game first, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, uh, how many symbols have you, have you collected so far? Of these, there's Atlantic? 21. There's uh, there's 21 collectively in this, and then the, tw- the 22nd symbol is a primer um, that actually interlocks with each of the symbols. So, um, you know. They're they're a part of, of of what I do. You know, it's something that it's it's that project that you're always working on in the shed um, while life marches on. Otherwise, you know, it's it's an ongoing, constant thing. So how does um, how does your research? How do you sort of research? I mean, have you got a list of all the symbols and you're trying to find them in the wild, or are you trying to discover new symbols by looking at ancient texts? How's it work? Your research? No, no, this they're complete in and of themselves. There's right. 21 of these. Do you know, um, and uh, and I had I didn't know this is totally not the direction I thought this conversation would go, but sure we're here now. Um, I was in L.A. and there was this really interesting guy. His, he was called Dr. Lou Graham, and he died a couple of years ago. And he was a very a good friend of mine. Um, you would have seen him on Grand Hancock. He wrote a series of books called Gnosis, um, right. one, two, and three volumes. Um, and what was interesting was Lou was speaking in oh, the year, how old my daughter is. Okay, I met him when I was pregnant with my daughter, so it was 2002. And Lou comes over, American guy, and he comes and he's doing this workshop in Galway. And, you know, I was at work, I was practicing um, and uh, had patients all day. And so I was going to arrive late to this workshop. And my friend had gone, just come to Galway. You're going to love this thing. He's talking about all sorts of ancient weird shit and you're going to love this. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. So I finished work. And I drive down with a friend of mine and, you know, they're underway and I walk in and there's like this flip chart and there's this dude and he's standing there and he's talking to the group and they're almost coming to a break. And I walk in the door and I've got this face and I'm like, what? Because on his flip chart are the first three symbols. And I'm like, no freaking way. Right. So what I had missed before I'd gotten there is that he's talking about these three pre-Atlantean symbols that come from an alphabet that they know is called Goet and all, and um, how he has spent his entire adult life, you know, and he had PhDs and everything, um, looking for the remainder of these symbols. And so he comes up, they break, and he's like, uh, uh, Dr. Hensley, welcome. You know, I see that... Uh, I might have said some things, you know, uh, that, that you might not be gelling with. He goes, I can tell by your face. And I went, no, 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 not at all. And uh, he was like, um, oh, oh, okay, really? And I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, my God. I walked in. There are the symbols. And he was like, yeah, you kind of came in on the tail end of that heavy conversation. And he's and I was like, well, where are the rest of them? He goes, well, I had just finished telling the group that I spent, um, you know, my entire career. I've been seeking these. And I was like, oh, I have them in my handbag. <laughs> and he was, here he was he was like boom you know and so thus began this great friendship and Lou was this just amazing character and so what's so bizarre is I'm meeting him in Galway Ireland in this little back alley you know workshop kind of thing he grew up 20 minutes from where I grew up wow and he played football against my father's football team. <laughs> and I'm like, this is nuts. So it was just one of those, you know, it was one of those moments where another, you know, another member of the team crosses your path. And so he's like, you know, what do you mean you have all these? And I'm like, here they are. And I shared them with them. And he was like, holy cow, I don't believe this. So long story short, I end up going out to LA because now he'd long since left the East Coast. He now lived in Beverly Hills and was doing all this work with these just like stuff that you see on some kind of sci-fi, you know, you're like at some sci-com thing and he knows all of these very unique people. And I go out and this is not a word of a lie. Um, you know, look, you made it safe for me to talk about this. (laughs) Um, but I go and I'm, I meet him out in, in LA and he's like, we're going to meet a friend of mine. And I went, okay. And so we go and we meet a friend of his. And this guy was quite unusual. Let's just put it that way. And so I go home. I'm staying in his, in, in Lou's Hollywood mansion, which is just so weird. You know, it's totally surreal. I like living in a little cottage here in Ireland. You know, I'm 
whatever. And I'm in this, like, it's, it's like some other hologram. And next thing I go to bed that night and this dude appears in the, in the room at the end of the bed. <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, that's the guy that I just met this evening. Mm-hmm. And he just waves at me. So the next morning, I go downstairs to breakfast, and Lou's sitting there, and he's this is back in the day when people read the newspaper, and he's sitting there, and he's reading the newspaper or whatever. And I go, hey, um, had a little visit last night. And he goes, puts the paper down. He goes, oh, really? Tell me about it. And I'm like, uh, your friend showed up, and then he, oh, he's laughing. And he was like, welcome to the family. And I am like, what? where are the cameras? What is going on here? So this guy that turns up has basically they were checking to see if I was kind of authentic, if I could, if I could really do and see and experience, you know, could, had experienced the things that I said I had and um, yada, yada. So next thing they tell me that this guy, you know, I was aware of the fact that there had been a supernova, planets exploded, and that there had been 12 planets in our solar system and not nine and Um, you know, the moon that we have now is a chunk of a planet that came through as, you know, like you see in the asteroid belt, you know, just common stuff you'd have over a cup of tea. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so they're like, this dude was Tiamatian from a a place called Tiamat, right? Whoa. Which was a planet. Oh yeah. Whoa is right. So Tiamat is right. That's the old uh, Babylonian creation myth. Mm-hmm. Tiamat was it, torn asunder. It's not, it's not a myth. Well, <laughs> so anyway, there was a planet. Okay, so anyway, those um, there were many who left there apparently um, before that destruction. The same as they knew here, and were able to send people out from you know from the Atlantean civilization. They were able to send emissaries to Egypt and across to Turkey, and uh, you know that they they knew they were going down. You know, it wasn't like it happened in a split second overnight. Like this was a celestial event that could could be seen and predicted. They knew it was coming there. You know, certainly wasn't any way to get out of it. Um, and so all they could do was spread themselves as far across the globe as possible so that the information, you know, and their history stayed alive. Holy you know? shit. Yeah, I know. Right. So, so you had a visit so from Tiamat. Then, like, Mr. Hologram comes in and he's, you know, and they're like, well, this, you know, a whole bunch of them were able to get off of their planet. They came, they, you know, they, they took on human form here. And I'm like, I'm like, a, I'm, I'm a preacher's daughter. I was a cheerleader. Do you know, like, I, I like, I like cold beer. Do you know, like, I, I like, I was just, I, yeah, I don't want to get involved yeah. in all Welcome this. Welcome to my world. Right. <laughs> so, Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know what, it's so funny because I'm like, of all the people, the powers that be could have chosen to dump all of this on. And that's what's so funny about it because I'm like the last, you know, the last person, you know, okay, okay, I'm a doctor, you know, I'm not stupid, but you know, like as far as like all the, all of the astrophysics that go behind this, the frequency, the, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. I've really had to educate myself into the role of what got put on top of me. Do you know? Um, let's, so, can we just go back to the, we just sort of gl- glided over the, the, the supernova. What's all that about, Mary? Can you tell us more about that? Cause I've never heard this. Let's grow coup again. <laughs> What's the the supernova you're talking about? I've never heard this before. Okay. Okay, so supernova explodes and it hurls towards our the the trash of that explosion. Right, so not our star, like a, a, a nearby star. Yeah, gravitates towards our sun, right? In the process, so this is where our asteroid belt comes from, is, is the explosion of one of the planets. Um, Pluto, we're not counting, um, you know, and uh, but that there were, in fact, 12 celestial bodies there as opposed to the nine that we thought we had. And so um, how misunderstood that is. And so as that um, is moving towards, and what's so interesting was the fact that prior to that cataclysm, 
when we're like, oh my God, how did symbology and how did these myths and, and these, these stories travel from one civilization to the other on the planet? And like, you can't, because there was no, there were no tides because prior to that cataclysm, we had a small satellite that circled the earth and not one that was enough to interact and interface with the gravitational pull that creates the tides and also that creates the pull that we experience within our bodies, which of course are, you know, 74% water. And, and, you know, we wonder why we're so affected by the, by those lunar cycles. Um, So as this rubbish is moving towards the sun, um, it's getting caught in different gravitational pulls. So there's our asteroid belt, right? And then as it moved towards what we did have as a moon, boom, gets knocked out, just hurled off, you know, and a much larger chunk gets caught into our pull, right? right? And that would be the moon that we that we know today. So it's not like it's an, you know, it's a spacecraft or that it's man-made or that it's whatever, but it's the, um, it's a piece of planet. Um, one of the, know, that was after having, one. yeah. Yeah. One of the three that was destroyed. What, have you right. any conception of when this happened? Yeah, this was that, that, I mean, when, when it was experienced here. So in 2002, it was 13,000, 13,774. So 2002, what is that? 18, 19 years. Add that on top of, no, 13,664, 74, 84. So just about 13,683 years ago. All right. What day of the week? (laughs) You're very precise. It was Tuesday at (laughs) 2.30. Um, you're very precise no, there. Just, that's all that, right. on the on the on the date i know you know because it's just like you know people were like how do you know what you know i don't how do i know what i know how can i do what i do i'm like you know you die you come back in this body and then there you've got like this bizarre kind of autistic uh element to who you are and you have to embrace it and you know that's what it is <laughs> there's various Different theories, isn't there, about what terminated the last ice age, whether it was meteor strikes or coronal mass ejection or vice versa. Mm-hmm. But you're saying that it, the, that your belief is it was a nearby supernova that caused this mm-hmm. ice age to mm-hmm. turn. Wow, that's wild. I love it. Because mm-hmm. that would explain, yeah. I mean, presumably something, I don't know if it, a supernova would create the same effect as a coronal mass ejection, but it may be a catalyst for a coronal mass ejection uh, ejection from our sun maybe exactly you know because if you're talking about aspects of um you know of of like how big is this stuff that's moving towards and goes into the sun and causes a you know it's like detonating a nuclear bomb you know sure yeah yeah so i'd say in tandem as opposed to independent theories of i'd say they're part of the same story Now, um, you just hinted about it before. People ask you, how do you know all this stuff? And would I be right in thinking that this is linked to the the NDE, the near-death experience? Yeah, right. Why don't, could you talk us through the uh, the NDE? Because it's something we've talked about before. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, and it didn't, I I can't say it all started there because, I mean, I was a little um, unusual from the (laughs) get-go. Um and you just learn to love it. You know, you embrace it. But my, my father was a Southern Baptist minister. So I grew up in the Bible Belt in right. the States. And um, my mother, when she was pregnant with me, had the German measles. And so um, they got called in and they were like, listen, I was the, the I was the, that 40s surprise baby. <laughs> and, um, you know, they got called in and they were like, look, um, first trimester, German measles, this is not going to work out well. So the baby's not going to be okay. You need to go home and get your head around that. And, um, you know, this is back in, I was born in 69. So this is 1968. So they're like, there was no, no way to change the way that was going to work out. No, you know, um, so my parents go home and then my father, um, who's, you know, again, that, that minister, um, gets this visit. And what was so interesting was my dad was like this really huge man. And he was, you know, he always talked about sports. He was a great big American football player and he was a football coach and people loved to listen to him preach because it was always about sports. And so he could some, he could tie every scripture in any holy text into football and people loved it. And so, um, 
he, though, goes to bed one night and gets a visit. And what was so interesting, because based on his box and, and, and what he operated from, he we thought he would have called these like angels or he had some kind of a Holy Spirit or something. And he couldn't. He said all he could say, he called them celestial beings. And, they, you know, they did not have wings. They were not angels. It wasn't just a voice. These were, these were true physical presences that came. He spoke to very clearly. And my father would not be the first, first and only time anything like that ever happened. And so basically they said, listen, um, the baby is going to be fine. She, they identified as a she, she is going to come in and she's going to have some unique gifts. And you're going to need to to help her through this because it's going to be very different than what you're accustomed to. And so, you know, my dad is like, and so they're always kind of, so I'm born and there's no issues and they're like freaking out and they're always kind of waiting for the shoe to drop. You know, when's the weird stuff going to start? And, you know, they get through they, that first couple of years and they're like, okay. And then, then we have what I call the kitchen table talk. And my father calls me in. I'm like four. My best friend at that stage is my grandfather, Dr. Garland Clark. Um, and he, we called him judge. That was his nickname. And he was a medical doctor, um, from Kentucky and ear, nose, throat surgeon. He was, he was just a really cool guy. And, um, uh, I used to hang out with him. And so he was just my bud. And so of course my mother loved this. That's her daddy. And it, we were the best of pals and I talk about everything until one day I get called into the kitchen and my dad says in that big Southern booming boy, he says, sugar, do you know the difference between alive and dead? And I'm like, I'm four. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Okay, no, I guess, uh, you know, and so it turns out Judge had been dead since I was one. Oh, so I'm like <laughs> telling all these Judge stories and all this stuff that he's told me, and they're just like, ha, 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 ha. yeah, Judge is dead. So that's the first sign that something, something, the strange things are afoot at the Circle K, right? <laughs> and so now they're watching, and as I get older, Things are happening. I'm having prophetic dreams. Um, you know, my father, of course, being a minister, he was always writing eulogies. I'm like, hey, dad, heads up. Mr. Jones is dying on Tuesday. And, um, <laughs> you know, it was a really unusual childhood. And so oh, shit. by the time I get through high school and college and I get to the point where I've had this near-death experience, I have these incredible gifts. And the last time I had done anything with one was I, like I mentioned, I was a cheerleader and, uh, my roommate, I had, it was the only person I had ever told cause my father wanted us to keep my, my special abilities to ourselves. And he, I think he was worried about exploitation and he didn't know what to do with them either. Yeah, and, being um, protective, that's but what I had let do. the cat out of the bag and, um, you know, told my roommate. And so she was also a cheerle cheerleader. And so we used to write down the scores to the basketball game and stick them in an envelope. And we'd go and we'd cheer, cheer, cheer. And everybody would come back to our room and crack open a beer and open the envelope. And there was a score to the basketball game. So this was the extent of my service to humanity, right? <laughs> so I hit 21 and I have this um, near-death experience. And so I just graduated from college. And in the South, if you're, if you're dating the guy in you know the final year of college, um, if you're still dating him when you graduate, your mom's like picking out the china and the crystal. And, you know, so you go to his hometown. And so off I go to South Carolina, to Charleston. And um, it was Christmas. It was December 14th, 91. And I was on my way to a Christmas party for the company that I worked for. And, you know, I had my big degree in communications and graphic design, and I was mopping floors in a sign company. And um, they were having the Christmas party, and it was hot in Charleston, South Carolina. I was wearing shorts and T-shirt, my little Santa Claus jingle bell around my neck. And I go and I pull up to a stoplight at a major highway, um, so lanes coming this way and lanes going this way. And I have to cut across and go towards town. So I'm waiting at my red light. And then when my light finally turns green, I get all the way across these lanes of traffic until I get to the last one. And I turn and I look and I'm like, oh, that car's not going to stop. And this guy floored it to try and get through. Oh. He was obviously running a red light. 
So I'd had time to make it all the way across. And then this is when it just got really interesting because everything just stopped. And it just started creeping at a snail's pace. And I am now acutely aware, all right, I'm getting ready to die. There's no, I'm no, I'm not scared. There's no nothing. I'm suddenly smarter than I was five seconds ago because I'm going, I've done this before. All right. How do I want to do this? And like literally everything's just creeping around me. And I said I could, ex- I could stay in the body and experience the impact if there was something I needed from that. And I was like, um, or I could get out and I could observe. And I'm like, yeah, that first option is going to hurt. And I don't think I need anything out of that, I, you know. And so I took option B. And when I decided that I was going to come out of the body before the car hit me, there was this weird sound. And this is why I'm so into frequency. There was like this drone. And so I have, you know, many years later learned that that vibration is what keeps that spirit or soul or essence of who and what we really are tethered to this 3D reality. So there is a sound, a frequency that accompanies that. And so when I made the decision to scoot, that sound gets louder, 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 louder. And as long as I was there and able to witness what was happening, that sound was always present. So I make my choice. I'm up. Everything speeds back up and bam, I'm hit 75 miles an hour. The car is T-boned. I watch my head go through the window. My neck is broken. There's glass everywhere. And I'm just watching. And this car is spinning around in the the intersection. Everything is like full, full speed ahead. And I have like no attachment to the body. I'm not upset. I'm not pining away. I'm just fully present. And that drone is playing in the background. So I am literally witnessing my own death. And here's what's so interesting for anybody who's ever lost anyone. This is, this is not something that just happened to me. This happens to everybody. And so when you are, when the body is giving the appearance of a struggle or it's a horrific or tragic or suicide or cancerous, you know, your demise is just awful and torturous or whatever, that same principle applies. Time literally just stalls and it stands still. And as the soul is able to come out, the body can still give the appearance of being alive to those who are watching. Yeah. But the individual has the choice and will only stay in the perceived misery or agony or torture if they need to extract something from this. And because we've dissociated so much from the, the idea that we put ourselves here, that we came here to, you know, to experience what we wanted to get from this, that we're travelers, explorers who put ourselves into these incarnations in order to, to glean information from the life, you know, because we love a good drama. We're like, Oh my God, he died tragically. You know, I'm, when I moved to Ireland, my favorite thing when I first got here, uh, you know, for somebody who's been dead, I just found this so humorous. You know, you'd find the boom, boom, the bells would chime every day. The radio would be on at 12 o'clock in the office. And my secretary's hanging by the edge of her seat, you know, and Donald Jones died tragically. And Julia Smith died suddenly. And there's all these incredible adjectives around the way they died. You know, the yeah. Irish are just so great at that. Mm. And so... You know, it's really, really interesting how we have forgotten that we're, you know, we're literally driving the bus, do you know? And yeah. at that moment of when, when your turn comes, when your time to go comes, you're in complete control. Wow. It may give all other appearances to other people who are watching, but that's for them. That's for their benefit. And so this is why I tell people often who are going through a death process with somebody, don't hijack somebody's death with your grief. Don't hijack it with your mess. Don't bring your BS into somebody's death because that is a special, sacred, amazing time. And don't try and don't try and take over, you right. know, because you love a, a little drama. And this is why so often we will get people who will tell that story where they're holding vigil hour after hour, day after day, week after week, and then they go to the toilet and the person dies. You know, and we hear that story over and over again. Um, And this is the very reason why, because that person literally can't detach because the energy of that other person's grief or their expectation or their unfinished business or whatever it is, they will envelop that person who's literally trying to raise their vibration and get the hell out of that body. 
So, you know, I'm telling people often have respect for somebody's death process the same way you would. You don't come in on a new mother who's, you know, the whole town and then they're going, come on, you know, push, push, push. <laughs> you know, when a baby's coming in, it, you know, but we like to surround people when they're dead, you know, oh, we were all there. We were all there. I was like, yeah, I bet he was delighted about that, you know, get the fuck out. And, um, but that's what we do. And mm. we go in and we take over because we think that we know best about how somebody wants to go. Do you know? What happened um, so, yeah. once you witnessed your own death and you're still you're still above and then everything speeds up and you see the car crash and you know, everything head- speeds up. I'm watching. And what the happens? best way I can describe to anybody who's watching this, this is, uh, you know, and I say it over and over again, but it, it just works. If you were outside and it was and it was really hot and you were mowing the lawn or you were painting or doing whatever outside and you're all nasty and sweaty, you come in the back door, you peel off the clothes, you throw them down by the washing machine, and you go get in the best shower of your life. You're like, oh, this is amazing. The last thing you're thinking about is the dirty clothes next to the washing machine. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly what leaving the body is like. You're not pining away for the, you know, for the nasty jeans. You know, you're not just dying to get back into your your smelly T-shirt. And leaving the body that has just carried you through X number of years, it's not, you're not desperately trying to get back into that. You know, you're back in a space where you realize that, that was awesome. That was an amazing trip, you know. Um, and you're looking at that with really nothing but just a sense of complete gratitude. If, if that it's like a, it's just a detached interest, detached, you know, yeah. you just, cause you know how it works when you're in that, in that phase of the transition, you're now remembering. That's what, I and that's, wait, what's really cool. I just wanted to pick up on that. Is you mentioned at the beginning of the, of the crash that you said that you'd been through that before. Is that what you said? Yeah. So imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't teach us that in Sunday school. Um, Yeah. So you're suddenly realizing, oh, I've done this before many times because you are now aware that, you know, life and death, it's like walking from one room to the next and that you have come here. However, however many times you've chosen to come here or felt the need to be here, you, you know, you've been here before this idea that religion likes to create around the, you know, the one lifetime, because it's Mm. really easy to control people if they think they've got one go. Yeah, and they really screwed this up, you know. And it's yeah. really just not how it works. So, would you, would you describe it as like a, fam- a familiar al- a familiarity, like you're familiar familiarity. with the process? Is that, that, that is that the famil- familial famil- familial <laughs> the familiarity? <laughs> yeah. Familiarity. Yeah. Do you f- that, is that the sense? Is that the sense? Is that the That's feeling? That's exactly how I would describe it. Yeah. So yeah. you, you sort of automatically know, go realize what's going on, and therefore you you feel this sort of affinity remember. with the experience. Remember, you remember. At uh, the mm-hmm. time, it's like that moment. You know, if you and I were playing Monopoly, like you, <laughs> you know, you know, you're not the shoe, and you know I'm not the dog, and you know I can't buy Park Place with the five hundred dollar paint, you know, bill. But we suspend our version of reality for a while in order to go play that game. And we're in it. And we're like, yeah, give me the money. You know, I'm setting up houses and I'm doing all that. We know that's not real. But no. for a while, we suspend everything we know to be true in exactly. order to enjoy that game. Yeah. And it's quite similar in that moment. And then that moment where you come out, and that vibration is bringing you up out through that plane. You're like, oh, oh yeah, there's a whole lot of that. Oh, oh, yeah. Wow, that's a really yeah, awesome. cool analogy. The the Monopoly game. Mm. Oh, I tell you what. The um, you mentioned like the time dilation, the way time slowed down. And um, last year, I don't know, was it last summer, or last autumn, when we had yeah, Ian I was Lyons? Say about Ian Lyons, yeah. We had uh, a Very chap similar, called, isn't it? Yeah, we had a chap called Ian Lyons who was in the ro- in the army, in the Royal Signals, and he was a parachute instructor. And he was doing an exhibition parachuting competition in front of a crowd, and a hundred feet up, his chute collapsed, and um, and he had a, an, an NDE, and he described um, the sort of witnesses around him. They said he, he had mixed opinions from the witnesses. Some say he never lost consciousness. Some say if he did lose consciousness, it was for a few seconds. 
But I think if I remember right, he's he described it as lasting ten years. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, mm-hmm. like it just it, his life review. If you like, he, he, he said it was like a forward mm-hmm. life review that seemed to last for a decade. Mm-hmm. And it's just playing into this thing that you're talking about about our perception and consciousness and time. Mm-hmm. It, we're fucking strange beings, well, time aren't is we? something that we've created for this construct. Do you know, it's not, it doesn't apply everywhere else in the same way. And that's, and that's so hard for us to kind of get the gray matter around because <laughs> we don't know anything else here. But then see when you've stepped out of the body and then you, you came back in, it's really weird because like I have to pretend in so many scenarios that like, Oh, I'm scared or I'm sh- <laughs> Like, do you know, like, it's hard sometimes. It's like, that's, that's the real fallout for it. You know, of, of having been dead is that you, you get it. You understand how all this works, I, I, you know, and there are times when I have to engage and act like I actually care in situations that I don't, I have complete trust and faith in, do you know? Yeah. Um, but the time thing is really interesting. And here's where my mind was blown. Um, after after that sound changed, when we went from that drone to like this, what I call the music of the spheres, like this crazy high vibe symphony. I mean, like you can't, there's just no words for it. And um, as that's happening, I was here watching the accident and then suddenly I was here, you know, and if the tunnel happened in between, I missed it Um, because I was just, it was instantaneous. But when I land in this space where there's like this incredible, like these colors that we don't have, and there's this palpable atmosphere, like it, these, these two beings step out of the atmosphere. And in that moment, I'm like, oh my gosh, these are, this is like the same thing my dad saw. Right. And so what was so wild is that they, they literally formed out of the atmosphere. And I think they took that shape on for my benefit because I was, you know, there I was freshly dead. And, you know, like they didn't want to scare the daylights out of me and, you know, you know, wah, 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 you know, just, so they took on a form that was familiar to me because I still like, I was still very connected to the idea that I've just been alive. I was a 21 year old girl. I've, you know, just left the bod behind and, you know, I'm kind of just remembering everything all at once. And so I'm there, they step forward. And once I finally recognized, they waited. They, I, I finally go, oh, my God, these are my guides. Oh, God, shit, we've got guides. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, like, these guys have been with me forever. So that idea that you've ever been alone, you've never been alone, ever. You know, not in a creepy, I'm watching you in the shower, you know, <laughs> kind of day. But, like, um, they're just, they're there. And... <sighs> After they allowed me the, the space to remember and recognize them, that's when I did my my life review. And what was so strange about that was that, and this was the mind-blowing part, is I am now suddenly in the middle of this space that looks like a 360-degree cinema. This is happening around me. So now my mind, I, I can, oof, just even talking about it now, all, and I've talked about it a million times. You're standing in the center of this and I'm watching myself get in the kitchen table talk when I'm four. I'm winning living history day in junior high school at the age of 12. I'm dressed as PT Barnum. I am being raped at the age of 17. I am winning my spelling bee at the age of six. I'm driving the car for the first time by myself at 16. I am kissing my first boy at the age of whatever it was. Um, All of this is happening around me simultaneously. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. Everything is concurrent. So when I'm teaching about past lives, I do it because I've had people literally melt in front of me because they cannot conceptualize of this. But time does not march forward in a linear fashion for everybody. People can have that experience. That's how we do history here on the 3D plane. But what's happening in reality is all of these things are happening simultaneously. So this idea, you can't change the past. Hell yeah, you can. Just like that. Um, yeah, but, you, you know, and the future is, is yet to be done. Mm. All of it's happening at the same time. Wow. Right? And I'm like, 
oh my gosh. So now all of a sudden I'm realizing, oh, I'm going back. I'm going back guys. And they're, I'm like, put me in. And, um, I, I'm now going back into this world with an understanding that for some reason, the vast majority of people who have a near death experience, they come back in and they're like, Oh my God, it was incredible. And the love, and you've got nothing to worry about. And, all, and that's all they've got. Mm. And that they, they would have had the same experience, but for whatever reason, they don't remember it. Well, you know, um, autistic Annie here comes back in with every memory of everything and realizing, Oh, Oh oh my gosh. So I literally had to come back in here and reinvent the entire way that I would interact with this world because I'd put myself back in here for a reason. And it wasn't to continue to play the game the same way because I've never been able to since that day because I understand things in a completely different way. I should be dead a million times over at this stage. I've had cancer twice. I've had a brain tumor. I've been gang raped. I had COVID. I had like every opportunity to get out again, do you know? And I no, I'm like healthy and well and doing my thing and spending all my time telling anybody who's going to listen, listen, just enjoy your time here. Do that thing, that thing you're terrified to do. Oh my God, please go do it. Do you know? Please go do that. Please take every risk possible. Yeah, that's a great positive attitude to have, isn't it? You know, a lot. It's of not it... even a positive attitude. It's it's the only way I can do it. Right, it's your operating system, and that that was a fundamental change as a result of the NDE, was it? Were you just a well? I mean, you, you said you know you had your sort of special skills in childhood and whatnot, but was this a big sea change in your life when this happened? It must oh, have been. absolutely. Well, because you know, in essence, we have two brains. You know, we've got the you know, let's talk, call it processor one and processor two. Yeah. You know, you've got that kind of animal brain, that amygdala, um, that fight or flight mechanism, that one that causes us to be able to ra- react in a split second. And really, so many people work from brain one, you know, and then we have the brain two, which is that kind of simultaneous existence of this logical processing system where I can throw something at you and, you know, you, you run it through your filters and then you disseminate your reaction and information after having thoughtfully arrived to a conclusion. And it's like I (sighs) dancing between the knowledge of how both of those brains work and how both of them are so necessary in order to create the illusion of the human existence, you know, of, of, you know, of being able to look at you. I can't believe you did that to me and to react. Those, that animal brain, that reptilian brain, it's not something that we've tried to evolve out of. It's something that has evolved with us in order to be able to elicit a reaction that allows us to interplay with one another, one another in a way, um, you know, that, that gives us the experiences that we're coming here for. Yeah. It's an, a necessary evil, if you like. Yeah. You know, it's not even an evil so much. It's just, uh, you know, it's that you know, people couldn't get depression without that, that people couldn't have the experience of not feeling good enough. People couldn't have, you know, th- there's everything, everything that we come here to grow through, to learn about, to, uh, you know, how to evolve past, how to move, you know, we, I used to be this and now I'm this, or I used to have this understanding and now I have this understanding. And, um, you know, I used to work out of this and now I work out of this. And this, this brain allows us to go into these kind of hyper reactive states where we don't use our common sense and we don't use that, which we have gathered to the point where we do it so many times that it becomes painful. We lose relationships. We piss people off. We do, you know, and then we're like, okay, hold on a second. Let me not jump straight back into that. Let me go back into that prefrontal cortex and let's see what happens here. If I, if I run that through a few filters there and Oh my gosh, there's a completely different outcome. And so, you know, that's what the soul comes in to learn experience and, and grow through. And so it's like, for me, I'm like sitting back and I'm observing the same way I was observing the accident scene unfold. I sit back now and I'm watching and I watch people right now. Like in in my office, I've had in the last month, I've had 10, 10, 10 suicide attempts um, from ages eight to 83. Oh my God. 
And I'm watching that process and I'm speaking to these people, you know, and they're like, you know, I have you know, parents bringing the children or the teenagers or their elderly or, you know, who are just, they've had enough. They're quite, you know, I'm going, look, it's a choice. And they're like, you can't talk to them that way. And I'm like, oh, I can. And I will. It's a choice. It's a tough choice, but it is a choice. You can do this or you can do this, do you know, and it is nobody else's responsibility to make that happen for you or to make your life better or to get you out of this space. You have to get yourself through this. Now we're here to support you, mm. but we're not going to make the decisions for you. And we're not going to change you or beg you to stay alive. And they just go, you know, and it's kind of, it changes the way that people interact when you read. It's not that nobody cares. It's that no, look, create your own drama, get yourself out of your own drama. And, oh, but what if they're not able? Nobody came here who's not able. Do you know? And if somebody gives the appearance that they're not able, as in, let's say somebody is so severely damaged or there's, you know, their needs are so, so many um, that they give the appearance of not being self-sufficient. The big ha-ha is that you think you're there helping them when they're actually here creating opportunity for you. And so I, you know, with so many of my families who have children who are downs or who are autistic and I'll sit down and I'm going, the mistake you're making, the difficulty you're creating for for yourself is you think that your mission is to make life better for them when you're failing to realize that they're here teaching something to you. They're going to be just fine. That's amazing. And they just, uh, you know, we, uh, I'm and so how we, we devalue people based on what we think is important experience. It's like, look at, look now. And they're trying to get all these families with kids who are with special needs or, um, people who have these, you know, major underlying preexisting conditions. Hey, if you're going to get that vaccine, how about sign this? Do not resuscitate. Uh, I'm sorry. Why? Why is that? Because their life is any less valuable than somebody who doesn't have special needs. Um, and that's, that's the big disappointment of where we sit as a civilization right now is that we have valued um a the quality of somebody's life by its quantity oh they were robbed they were cheated at an early age they they didn't get to live all their years that has nothing to do with that and and the idea that we think just because somebody isn't able to follow into mainstream conformity that their life is any less valuable than than somebody else's you know those are the two big cosmic jokes right now yeah, that to, to harken back again, uh, probably about 70-odd episodes ago, we had Daniel Bruce Levin, who uh, wrote a book called The Mosaic. It's like a modern fable. Mm-hmm. And he talked about his daughter, who had um, special needs, and how much his daughter had taught him about himself mm-hmm. and about life in general and how much he'd grown... Uh, learning from his daughter and it's it it chimes exactly with what you were saying Mm -hmm. and that we've lost our way about what's valuable and what isn't valuable exactly we we just worship the material it seems and therein lies you know and they're like oh my god why did we have to have this pandemic i'm like are you serious you know this is the best thing that happened to us in a very long time. I'm ha- I don't know about you, but like I'm having best pandemic ever. <laughs> I like I've been training for this my whole life, man. I'm in my element, you know. Why is Bring that? It. Why is that? What is it about the because, pandemic? Because like everything I stand for is about breaking through these old molds and ideas about who and what we are and why we're here. And I'm going, dude. When the pandemic sets in, we've suddenly moved from this. 3D world, we've blown right past 4D, and now we're in 5D. And 5D, you know, we, we've we've literally tesseracted, you know, and all about choice. And people who are sitting here confronted, well, I can't do that because they said, who who's they? Mm. Do you know? Exactly. And so, like, in my office, in my space, people come in and they're like, it's so funny. They'll walk in and they're like, you're not wearing a mask. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Well, you have to. I said, I don't have to do anything. And it's so interesting because that door that you just came in, it actually works both ways. Bye, Felicia. You know, and so I've created the world that I want within my world. Now, if if there's a shop that I need something from and they require me to wear a mask in there, I either don't get what I need out of the shop or I put the mask on and I go and get it. That's my choice. Yep. In my space, 
everything I stand for about trying to teach people about how the human body works and that it is here to work for the soul's experience. It's not the other way around. And that the body is this intricate, amazing, infinitesimal expression of um, it, it just it's the best system it's the best checks and balances it's like okay a soul comes in it has a mission about x y and z it wants to complete hey you're a little bit off target guess what the body's going to get sick hey you're a little bit off target guess what the body's going to go completely out of balance hey you're not on that path you set out for yourself guess what your mental health is going to suffer the body is set up to show us exactly what is going on, how we're in balance, how we're out of balance. And what have we done? We have done everything possible to bypass or medicate or downplay all of those signals that the body was designed to give us. And then we wonder why we're struggling. And so in my world, in my office, when people come in my door, I'm like, listen, everything I stand for is about teaching you how the immune system works, how the body functions, how keeping that of the body electric completely clear of interference. We don't need help. We just don't need interference. And so by keeping yourself in that space, you they can come in and say, yeah, I, you didn't do this. or da, da, da. I'm like, your crisis is not my problem. I'm here to help you if you need help through that. But you don't get to come in here and blame the fact that you have neglected your own health for 20 years and then impose your system on me and think that I'm going to conform to what you think health is because you haven't been doing your job. And so now you want to stuff me into a little mask and you want to compromise my own immune system when I've taken an implicit care of mine, you know, and you know how I've done that Mm. by not doing everything by the book. Do you know, I had an old professor in chiropractic school and he smoked probably 30, 40 a day. And he turned around. He said, I'm going to tell all y'all one thing. Cause people are like, doc, why are you smoking? That's so bad for your health. And he goes, listen guys, when the nuclear bomb goes off, it's going to be me and the cockroaches left living, not you. <laughs> and, and Keith, and Keith Richards. And so I never forgot that. So I've always been very much so of do a little bit of everything. Because we're cleaning ourselves now to the point that when people rip those masks off in about two years time, they're going to be so immunocompromised that it's going to, you know, it's going to wipe out a good portion of the civilization as we know it. You think that the sort of over sanitizing people uh, religiously cleaning every surface? Well, I mean, like it's one of the natural things, like when you see a kid on the floor Follow the babies. Look what they do. That's called pica. When they pick up dirt and stick it in their mouth, they're naturally immunizing themselves to the environment around them. I mean, I'm sorry. There is not a shortage of polysorbate 80, which is in some kind of a baby wipe within my body. Do you know, like, it's like, I don't want everything wiped down. I don't want everything crystal clean. You know, do I wash my hands? Sure. Do I overwash them? Absolutely not. You know, because that is so unhealthy. Um, and I don't think anyone has the right to tell me when I can and can't get sick because sickness is a part of my health regime. Uh, explain that. What do you mean by that? Sickness. Because my body is, you know, it's like some letting somebody pedal your bicycle for you. You know, we take all these pills. We take all these shots. We do all this stuff. That, okay, oh. that'll keep you from my body's immune system was designed to handle this stuff. And if something comes that my body can't handle... I'm going to die. Oh, and last time I checked, I'm not afraid of death. Do you know? So I'm here to live and I'm, you know, I'm not here for somebody to take those choices away from me. And so within my space, it's my rules. Do you know? Amen. And I respect other people's rules within their space. Yeah, I'm with you. Totally with you. We've just gone a bit sort but of crazy. I will fight the nail for choice. You know? The people who are out there queuing up for the, you know, they want some chimpanzee adenovirus injected yep. into their arm. Rock on, baby. I will fight till the day I die for their right to do that. But I will also fight till the day I die for my right not to. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Cracky, we're rocking up to an hour already, Mary. Mm. Jeez, there I'm you blown go. away. Time traveling. I know. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, there's Groku again. I've got his little, uh, I've got his little gear stick toy. I'll, I'll, yeah, catch, catch. <laughs> so, Mary, what do what do you want to um, plug? Where do we need to send people? The website. 
Um, my website is my name, maryhelenhensley.com. And uh, the newest thing that I've been working on is one of the things that happened when um, I went through the whole death experience, like I said before, was frequency. How important that everything is frequency and light, everything. And so, you know, literally it's just you know, how we interact with the world, how this hologram works. It's just, it's just particles of light sped up and slowed down. All right. And so I just released the first audio book on Amazon, um, audible called understanding is the new healing. Yeah. And the book is the first of its kind because it's backed with frequency. So let's say I'm telling a story and I'm talking about somebody's, um, somebody's experience with cancer and, and the means that they went to in order to discover how they got cancer and then how we help them to get rid of cancer. And so there's a frequency that goes with that particular, you know, the resonance of DNA, 528 Hertz, guilt, fear, grief, anger, shame, self-loathing. They resonate at 396 Hertz, you know? So if I'm telling a story in the book, the frequency is, running behind the story so that whoever is listening to that now is having an immersive experience where their body's going, Oh dude, I know that frequency. And they take the opportunity to realign same premises. If I have two guitars in a ring and I pluck the E string on one, the E string on the other vibrates. So if my body is still using a frequency, let's say if I still need to be sick for whatever the reason is in that moment, it's just a frequency. Frequency is just going to blow on by. But if I have gleaned all the information I need from that illness and I just haven't shaken it out of the body yet, that frequency will come in and allow my body the opportunity to realign and let go. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty revolutionary. And I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have this incredible um, sound engineer in Los Angeles, um, Greg Papagna, yeah. who engineered all these frequencies at signsmusic.com, S-I-N-E-S, signsmusic.com. And we have now created this incredible... Um, incredible system where people can have this completely immersive experience. It's changing the way that we listen um, so that we're not listening just with our ears. We're listening with the entire energy field. Wow. That's cool. Where did, where did people get the audio book? Oh, Mary, you, you can go, if you click on to Mary Helen Hensley.com, there's a link to um, it's out. It's on audible. It's on audible. Even better. Yeah. I've got some, yeah. I think I have some credits. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> understanding is the new healing that's what that's called and then you know i'm working on i've just finished the first book released in the um in a series for lgbtq kids um uh so that every kid can find themselves in a book um mm. and uh, yeah i got lots of different projects going on that's the other thing about being dead is like it's ADAD, attention dialed into another dimension. It's like constant, it never shuts off. I don't sleep. Uh, I don't sleep. If only, if only you could just slow time down on cue, you'd be fine then. You know. I know, but you know what? Look, for an eighty-seven-year-old, I think I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> well, Mary, it's been amazing. Really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. And um, just hang on the line while we play ourselves out. And uh, don't forget to check the links out in the show notes. You can find all the Mary Helen's work. It'll all be there. Just scroll down. It's there for you. Click on the link. Buy the books, etc., etc. Right. Ciao for now. See you on the flip side. All right, then we're back. The dwarf, the cripple, and the mother of madness. <laughs> As I chat with Mary Helen Hensley, go to maryhelenhensley.com. Mm, stop do, holding your tits. Do you notice I, uh, I, um, I oh, altered, <laughs> I altered my accent because no? I would, I would normally say Murray. All right, okay. Murray. Murray. So I'm, I was trying to say Mary. Murray. So Are that you was trying to uh, better yourself. No, just trying to be, you know, I imagine if you call Murray... yourself up by your bootstraps. A bit of, uh, a bit of, what do they call it? What's he been calling it recently? Uh, it's like, it's not, it's a new northern powerhouse, but I can't remember what the buzzword is. Shit, would it fit in? It'll come back to me. At the most inopportune moment. <sighs> right, you just ruined the, the, the flow there, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't so matter, we can get it back. Just go to maryhelenhensley.com. <laughs> And check out the links, check out the books. The audiobook sounds fascinating. I'm going to get that yeah. on Audible. 
just for some uh, some frequency healing in my sleep. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, sounds cool. Bit of music of the spheres. Bit of uh, who was it? Aristotle? Was it Ar- Harry Stottle? <laughs> he, he talks about the music of the spheres. It wasn't Archimedes. We screw. I think it was Harry Stottle. But yeah, this is a concept from ancient Greece that has been passed down in their wisdom from the Atlanteans. Yeah, it's all about frequency, baby. We're all vibrating. <laughs> is it good yeah, vibrations? It something to do with sacred sounds. Where sacred geometry, gematria. Yeah, all that shit. Kabbalah, esoteric subjects. Yeah. No, it was great. I really enjoyed that. I thought she was fantastic. I think yeah. I think I'm a little bit in love with Mary. Well, I felt a little bit of a vibe, but I didn't want to say. Bit of a vibration. Yeah, between the two of you. It seemed like you were you were laughing a little bit harder than normal to her jokes. <laughs> Housekeeping. <laughs> oh right, okay, just Housekeeping. It off. Housekeeping. Asna Cut it. Great. Really a this is a value for value podcast if you find this podcast valuable and how could you have not been entertained by mary she was fantastic one of my favorite guests and probably my favorite guest ever actually oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious this is serious yeah it's yeah love it first podcast um yeah we, there are a myriad of ways to become a producer and help us out um ben <laughs> Leave us a review on <laughs> iTunes. Sign up for the YouTube channel. Are you pointing at Matt? <laughs> going to do one each. We're going to go around well, the uh, screen. Okay. Um, uh, buy something from the Army Loose Chest. The Army Loose Chest. Yeah, link in the show notes for your... your um, you're what? Yeah, you're, um, I'm literally a communist. Hoodies and put on your fucking face masks. Who's got it next? Yeah. Me. Yeah. Send us send us some stories or um, you know artworks. That's three stories, artworks. Yeah. You can send artwork as long as it's fourteen hundred pixels squared, between fourteen hundred pixels squared and three thousand pixels squared, and we can upload it, and it can be the artwork for that episode, which is be quite an honour. Uh, I but think so. We have yeah. that service available. We are now two, uh, podcasting 2.0 compliant as well, following some advice from the Future Podfather. Proof. Yeah. Podfather Alan Curry. Subscribe to the Odyssey channel, and uh, that way we can earn some, some crypto. That's one way you could uh, that help, is. help us out. YouTube, particularly. If, we, if everyone who listens subscribed to YouTube, that would be really useful for us. It would open mm-hmm. doors for us to access other platforms and help the podcast be self-sustaining deadly serious if everyone listening subscribe to the youtube channel it would really help us out so please do that um what else we missed anything um just toss it as a fucking coin oh fuck toss a coin to your witcher oh valley of plenty people have got to understand vaccination is going to be in the end your route to liberty i think you're hitting hitting the point phil that uh, uh and it really bothers me uh uh cut a grape uh, uh but yeah, uh, go to the armistinquisition.com, find the PayPal button, sign up for a monthly or a one off. Um, yeah. Try to ignore Ben's mouse easy. clicks. Yeah. Anything else? Um, Housekeeping wise? Uh, producers. Is that next? Yeah, time to thank the producers for episode 176. We have online chemistry tutor Gav Scott, Nomi Noz Nodge, and Anonymous. Thank you. You're so amazing.
Support for another week. Got some uh, really cool, interesting stories sent us this week. I don't know if we'll get around to them all, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been a fairly interesting week. Should we move on to the uh, the Rona? Yeah, why not? COVID-19 news. If you let it rip, they would get infected very rapidly and soon be filling up your hospitals and unfortunately your morgues. Vaccination is going to be, in the end, your route to liberty. I wish we could vaccinate against stupidity. Uh, toss, toss the Elysium, mum. In the same ballpark as seasonal influenza. From hell. Uh, the magic vaccine. It's not going to allow us to go completely back to normal. Because you're getting bored and you want to have fun. Read the standing orders. Read them and understand them. Yeah, fucking hell, read them and understand them. Now then, I've been tracking this YouTuber... Dr. John Coleman, we've mentioned him before, played a couple of clips. You need the straight liner. The straight liner, yeah, who's some retired doctor, somehow ended up with, last time I checked, 918,000 subs on YouTube. Yeah. Coining it. Yeah, you're damn right, yeah. Yeah, with that amount of subs. And um, I've been having my suspicions about Dr. John, just oh, being a, another really? another mainstream mouthpiece. And um, I think my suspicions have been confirmed this week. Oh, Lord, um, let me see. He was talking about um, ivermectin. Have we heard of ivermectin? Uh, no. Is that like Tosselisi, man? Yes, except uh, I think it's mainly used in veterinary medicine for horses. Is that um, a person? No, it's Ivor rather than Ivor. Ivermectin. Oh, okay. Um and he was talking about something that the FDA put out. There's been a problem, you see, because it's some doctors have been using this. And do you remember the, the hydroxychloroquine story early last year? And doctors were prescribing it because people have, you know, so, certain studies have been done that have shown some efficacy. Mm. Same thing has happened with ivermectin. And so doctors are trying to use it. Unfortunately, people have been buying, like, the horse medicine, like the horse <laughs> dosage. Oh dear! And um, it's it's prompted the FDA to put a post up on the website explaining what this is and sort of warning people mm-hmm. off this. Um, but Doctor John was doing his YouTube video talking about ivermectin, and he he was trying to point out an inconsistency on the FDA's post. And I just picked this up. Just listen to this. So this is from the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. All this sort of stuff, official website. Here's how you know. So the FDA has uh, received multiple reports of patients who have required medical support and have been hospitalised after self-administration with ivermectin intended for horses. So really bad idea. I'm, I'm upset that people are doing that. But then they say ivermectin is not an antiviral. So here they made a statement. So what we want to do is, I don't think I'm allowed to disagree with official bodies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to report from a Nature Portfolio uh, Journal of Antibiotics. I'm not allowed to. Uh, uh, here. I'm not allowed to disagree with official bodies. Do you not think that's big uh, you to do with YouTube, though? Exactly. Yeah. And, and YouTube get the you can't you can't be on YouTube if you disagree with WHO. Even though there's a blatant contradiction on the FDA website. Mm. So what he does is he he he, he worms round it. And he shows the quote on the FDA website. Then he shows a study showing that ivermectin is an antiviral. Mm. He doesn't sort of, you know, he's ha- he has to be very subtle. Before, like thirty seconds before that clip, I didn't want I didn't want him to keep keep the clip count down. But before he starts on this, he says, "Now I wasn't sure if I was going to. I really wasn't sure if I was going to run this one." And then he goes to describe the the issue on the well, FDA imagine, website. Imagine losing nine hundred thousand subs. Uh, how how much do you reckon he's working make, making off ad revenue off nine hundred thousand subs? I don't know. It depends how many views each video gets, as far as I understand it. So is this is a metric between subs and views, is not just well one or the other. If you have a million subs and no one watches them, <laughs> you know you've got to have views. But the subs get you the views. 
Yeah. And the more subs you have, the more likely you're, you're going to be recommended to other people who aren't looking for you, who aren't a subscriber, the algorithms. Oh, okay. He'll be doing well out of it, I'm sure. I'm sure. Mm. But yeah, just something to watch with Dr. John. It's uh, it's not been approved as an antiviral by the FDA. It's, it's listed as an antiparasitic by the FDA. So that's what its license is for. It's not licensed as an antiviral. Licensed. Even though there are studies confirming Suggesting its anti- it has antiviral, antiviral properties. properties. Yeah. But uh, he didn't. Uh, he has to be very careful what he says. And if you're censoring yourself, you're kind of untrustworthy to me. But hey, right? what do I know? What do I know? Um, moving on. Um, over to our German friends. Oh, thank yes. God. Deutsche Welle. <laughs> Deutsche Welle. Yeah, uh, Deutsche Welle had a piece on the, the AstraZeneca blood clot story. <gasps> which has sort of just about sort of resolved this week. The EMA came out and said... It's fine. <laughs> the, well, the last I saw, they're going to add the uh, the condition onto the list of side effects. Possible side effects. And the official line is the risks still outweigh the benefits. Mm. Okay. So, yeah, if, you, if you're a 40-year-old healthcare worker and you happen to get this, well, mm. you know... You're doing that's you're taking one for the team. That seems to be the attitude. Uh, anyway, uh, DW had a story about this. Yeah, there's still some countries that are haven't gone back. The Scandi countries, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. What have not lifted the ban? No, and Denmark, I think it was, or it might have been Norway, one of those two uh, released today that they'd found someone who died and another one who was in intensive care with this brain, brain blood clot thing within 14 days. And uh, I think they've only given out something like 140,000 doses. So, something to watch. Anyway, back to DW. And you know how it is. They'd sort of... They interviewed a healthcare worker about it and the whole AstraZeneca blood clot issue and they always have to get like a talking head in the expert talking head to go over it, so I'll play this one for you. All right, reservations, hesitations, and some people expressing their confidence in the AstraZeneca vaccine. Let's bring in educator John Campbell. In- Hang on, John Campbell? I don't know that name. In the UK. Mr. Campbell, it's good to see you again. The British regulators, okay. um, the MHRA, they have reiterated that they think the vaccine should be used, but they say there have been reported blood issues and also that people should see a doctor if they get headaches after um, a jab. Is this an abundance of caution Mm. or is this a case of no smoke without fire? No, I think they are being very cautious. And what a confusing week it's been, really. We learned Mm. about the increased risk of blood clots. And when we talk about blood clots, we normally think about the blood clots in the legs, the deep venous thrombosis that can go up to the lungs, causing a pulmonary embolism, and they're very common. Now, it's interesting that the European Medicines Agency and the uh, MHRA... Is in a pub? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Unlikely. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely not a mainstream shill. Yeah. Dr. John. On Deutsche Welle. It's going up in the world. Yeah. Um, I thought I was going to say I had a point then, but it's gone. It's all right. Go. We'll move on. I'm sticking with Dr. John. Oh, is he everywhere this week? So, uh, you know, you just Have you can't... Found him out? You can't take this guy... You've got to take this guy with a pinch of salt. Um, okay. I wonder if this is going to work. Let's try this. Oh, my word. Oh, Lord. Oh, man. my word. Look at those production qualities. <laughs> this <laughs> is amazing. next level. Oh. My. Oh, look, oh. I'm even making it, making it oh, bigger in real on? time. Are you, are you fingering it doing that? I'm fingering. Have you got a, are you using a special tool? I'm using my finger and thumb. Oh. Um, in another video this week, Dot John, he's talked about this graph that was released by the ONS. Um, which describes the worst year in 102 years as far as deaths from viruses are concerned. 
I'll play the clip and then I'll just zoom in so you can see what he's actually referencing and talking about. Now, th- this graph here really is quite, uh, quite poignant. Let's have a look at this from the Office for National Statistics. So here we have the number of deaths registered due to infectious and parasitic diseases. This is, nine, I hope you can see that there, that's 1901, 1910, 1920, 2020, all the way through. And gratifyingly, we see the number of infectious and parasitic diseases go down from 1901 all the way through to 1960, and still a gradual decline even after 1960. And that, of course, was the influenza pandemic there, 1918. 1919 that killed so many people globally. Um, that was the Clostridium difficile's blip, and there we have the COVID-19 deaths. So really one heck of a spike there from COVID-19 deaths. And if we kind of trace that, if we kind of trace that line across roughly like that, um, and then trace that down, we see that it's the highest number of deaths since... 1918. So um, there you go. Highest number of diseases from in highest number of deaths from infectious diseases in England and Wales for 102 years. That is the significance of this uh, pandemic. Um, what is the difference in how the deaths were recorded over the last hundred years as compared to COVID? It's death is dying with COVID currently, not of something previously. It's uh, it's not actually relevant to this. Right. No, no. Um, I saw this. I, you, you can hear the. I mean, he's really putting the frighteners on, isn't he? He does. Yeah, he's like whoo, slams the pen down. He's like, oh god, this has shook me. The worst year for a hundred and two years. Mm. This couple worst, of things. It's, it's, it's the worst, the most deaths in any year for the last hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> I should have that lined up. I didn't think that far ahead. Uh, you did. The one thing that struck me, just looking at the graph while I was talking, is can you see the two humps, 1918, 1919? Mm-hmm. Do we want me to, want me to zoom in on them? There. That. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. Now, just before 1920? Yep. So he's saying that's the Spanish flu that killed 50 million people in Europe. And there's COVID at the end there. Nearly as high. Uh, that, the, the, the trend is massively downward, and then it's just a little double camel hump. I thought that doesn't look right. right. And also, if you read any history book, it will tell you that in the UK... Uh, the Spanish flu killed 228,000 people. It's burned in my head, that figure. Okay. And where is the figure there? It's less than 100,000 for both years. Mm. So something doesn't stack up, Dr. John, does it? So I, I, he puts a list of sources so on his YouTube description. So I went and there was the ONS link and I clicked on it. And this is a screenshot from a phone, but you can't see it. But if you scroll down slightly, it'll tell you, um, there's like two little hyperlinks that'll tell you which diseases were included in the graph and which weren't. Mm. Um, you have to go to an external source to find this out. The way diseases are classified, it was like one to nine or A to F. These were included in the graph. J to L weren't included in the graph. Let me tell you what Causes of death aren't included in this graph. Mm -hmm. Number one, influenza. Number two, pneumonia. Number three, upper respiratory tract infection. Number four, lower respiratory tract infection. And there's more. So he goes, oh, here's the Spanish flu. Look, look, there's the Spanish flu there, and look where we are this year. This is the, this is what's happened this year. This is the significance of COVID-19, he says. It's misinformation. Mm, well, it does sound like that, doesn't it, from that, what you've just that said? That is some expert analysis, certainly, right there. <laughs> it's really not hard to do. Have you not questioned him? If you... I, as soon as I saw it, Mm-hmm. And I double-checked how many people died 
Uh, well, at first I double checked how many people. Uh, Two hundred twenty-eight thousand died of Spanish flu. Double check that. Yes, that seems kosher. Mm-hmm. Then I clicked on. I went to the source on the ONS and I found the classification of diseases, and that's where it said that these diseases weren't included in this graph. So then I left a, a YouTube comment mm-hmm. saying, "Whoa, Doctor John, this uh, scary graph you've used. You might want to click on small print and double check that because this graph doesn't accla- a doesn't account for flu like the spanish flu for example or pneumonia and by the way over half the people um within the spanish flu season died of pneumonia bacterial pneumonia the 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 fact that over half of them died is because we didn't have antibiotics for the pneumonia Mm. it wouldn't have been out to do with them work covering the faces with dirty masks by the way definitely not that would have exacerbated the pneumonia but anyway that's a side note um, so I left a, a YouTube comment pointing out his error and that was March the 16th. He does a video every day. I've watched every one, nothing crickets, not mentioned it, no correction, nothing. And I went back to the ONS site today and they've changed it on our S. They've now before they had two hyperlinks explaining the different classifications of diseases and you would click on the hyperlink and it would say these were included and then the other hyperlink would say these diseases were excluded they've now added that influenza pneumonia were included in this graph so ons have been pulled on it by someone Mm -hmm. but you know dr john does a video every day uh his video you know it's yesterday's chip paper he's done his job he scared everyone Mm. And uh, he he moves on, but he seems a bit yeah. It's yeah. disingenuous. Uh, it's disingenuous by the ONS for a start for putting this graph out. Uh, yeah, it seems, but it fits the narrative, doesn't it? I don't that care about narratives. Know. I care about accuracy and well, truth. No, but the, yeah, but I don't think the government does, does it? Yeah. It's, what is the ONS? Is it an arm of? Is it a fucking propaganda arm of the state? Then can we not trust anything? If we can't trust the ONS, where do we get all our data from? Well, Ministry of Truth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think the thing is, is that the, I think it's naive to think that they won't be have pressure on them to to fit the narrative. Yeah, there's no way they're going to go against um, what the government's saying about. Um, how bad things are. Does that does that apply to Sage as well? Um, yeah, probably. And vice versa. I mean, yeah. Hang on, hang on, just watch this dissolve. <laughs> oh, oh. oh man. Do we like that? Excellent. Worth every penny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's disturbing. You know, you expect to go to a site like the ONS and be provided with an accurate representation of the data. And I think that's deliberately misleading. Yeah, and, you I know, so. if Dr. John's going to use this stuff uh, with the purpose of scaring people, uh, he needs to do a bit more. If it, if this is honest, he needs to do some a bit better due diligence with what he's putting out there. Yes. Seems he has nearly a million subscribers. Yeah, I mean... Well, he can't that... expect others to do that due diligence. I know you have, and, and we would, but, you know... 99% of the people who read that will just take it as, oh, this that's a scary graph and move on. And, and this kind of harks back to when the lockdown first came out and I, I was questioning, what are the fringe benefits of locking everyone down if it's not, you know, if the virus isn't isn't as bad as we think? And we were, this was at, at the very early stages when we were looking at how many people it kills and it was like yeah. 0.01% of the population and we are comparing it to other diseases and stuff. That's gone by the by, but now the focus is very much on what are those fringe benefits of lockdown, and look at the powers that the government have brought in to you know the con- con- coronavirus control act or whatever it's called. And just today, they were looking to extend that mm. way out from beyond the roadmap to October, um, and they're also looking at you know implementing powers to stop protests, which we've also mentioned on this podcast. Yeah. Um, what's What's next? This is the fringe benefits that I was concerned about at the start of the the pandemic. This is the government putting in controls that, under normal circumstances, they would not be able to do. 
And having people listen to the narrative and be focused on graphs like that allows that control to flow much, much easier because you have a compliant populace. The thing is, Dr. John is seen as a trusted source on YouTube. That's why he's been so successful, whereas I am the disinfo agent because I don't go along with the narrative. And this is a problem. I, I, last time I checked, I have no answer for a message from, from Deutsche Welle appearing on there to go over. <laughs> check, check again later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's worrying. And yeah, you're right. The, um, the coronavirus legislation had a built-in sunset clause, six months, and it's up, yeah. It's up for them to... Uh, for the next extension, which I have no doubt will go through because mm-hmm. we have a, a majority government and um, the opposition are not going to oppose any extension, as far as I can tell. I don't think Keith's in for that, is he? No. We wants it harder, to... faster. Harder, faster, dirtier. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll just finish off on Dr. John because... Um, I've got another clip. This is from the same video, the same one. You know, he's, he's prepping you now with the uh, scary graph from the ONS. And then um, I've got this clip, which I found a little bit disturbing from the same video. Now, it's just a matter of time until children are going to need to be vaccinated. A lot of people don't like the idea, but um, even if all adults, even if it was just over the age of 16 are vaccinated, there is sufficient uh, children, young people in any country to keep the vaccine, not not to keep the vaccine, to keep the virus prevalent. Um, And of course, that would spread it on to older people as well. So um, it's just a matter of time till children need to be vaccinated. No question about that. And uh, uh, Moderna has started a a research project. It's already started. Kid Cove study. It's in phase two stroke three clinical trials. Now they're in the process of recruiting 6,750 children to take part. Um, Now this mRNA1273, this is the Moderna vaccine we're using. Yeah, it's a foregone conclusion, it seems. What happened to herd immunity? (laughs) <laughs> oh, I thought we were there now, 60% in the UK anyway. Considering the people who've already had it. Yeah. And then the people, you know, we've vaccinated over half our population now have had the first dose at least. Half the adult population. Isn't Why it? would we have to start vaccinating kids as well? I don't know. Sell vaccines. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, other than that. And that's what I mean, I just... Because this, the, he's already said, Bojo, hasn't he, that it's, you know, a zero, a zero COVID strategy is not possible. No. So, so why do we need to vaccinate our kids? It's, just, it's worrying. I mean, it, over my dead body, there's no way in hell it's happening to my kids. I don't give a shit. But uh, if people are in any, under any illusions whether this is coming, it's coming. So uh, just prepare for that, and you might have to start having conversations with your other halves now and uh, how you're going to combat that because you might have a disagreement in your family, which could be really uh, tricky to navigate, wouldn't it, if one one parent wants the vaccine and one parent doesn't. So, uh, yeah, you need to start thinking about this now because um, they're going to come for your kids. I wonder if they'll... uh, And your pets... Did you know? Did you read that in today's? They were talking about cats and dogs showing um, heart issues. So some myocardial um, inflammation, and that had peaked a lot in line. So another graph with the second uh, lockdown and the second wave. So they've made a connection and said that they think that this uh, this COVID is is causing some heart and circulatory issues in cats and dogs. So, you know, well, that's another way of, of selling vaccines, isn't it? I mean, it's very expensive to get your, your jabs for your pets. And a lot of people do. I mean, the majority of pet owners keep their pets vaccinated, which is the right, the not, right thing to do. Not, against, it, you know, this not against coronavirus. What are the standard pet well, vaccines? Not, not at the moment, but 
again, that might be coming. So don't think you, you get away with this if you don't have kids. <laughs> you know, worry about your pets as well. <laughs> yeah, dogs are people too. <laughs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Oh, something I wanted to bring up. You know, um, on coronavirus, we've been hearing about variants now for a few months, haven't we? Um, different variants, variant this and variant that. And if you go on the WHO, uh, the variant is the idea that the vaccine mutates and uh, some variants, I guess, will be kind of benign and then some might cause an increase in uh, transmissibility or whatever. Uh, And if you go to the WHO website, they have... They're sort of uh, categorised, so there's variants and then there's a second category, variants of concern... Mm-hmm. And we have a handful of these now, um, B one one seven seven or something. They all they all have yeah, fun. That's... Sorry, go on. Sorry, I think that's the South African one, isn't it? B one one seven or B one seven seven. Right, yeah. The, the first for ease of use, they sort of named them after the place where they were first discovered, and presumably are, are more prevalent, don't they? So there was South Africa. Um, what else? There was a UK one. That U- I UK. think it was the UK variant. The first one. UK. What's Brazil? Brazil. UK, South Africa, Brazil. Um, just remind me, where were the vaccine trials conducted? UK. <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> and Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. Interesting coincidence, that, you know. Yeah, what we spoke about last week. Yeah. And then shortly after, there's two more actual variants of concern that appeared after those three, the two California variants of concern. And uh, when we talked about the vaccine trials, when they released the data, we mentioned that they were currently doing another trial in America. (laughs) Maybe nothing to see here. It's just a bit odd. (laughs) A bit odd, that something i realized Mm. today Mm. look out for a a new israeli variant i would suggest they're a 110 percent vaccinated population now aren't they yeah let's just hope that these these vaccines don't promote immune escape and mutations which are uh, detrimental to our health like like you said last week that dutch guy geert van den bosch that was his thesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just a bit weird that that the those three variants are. Yeah. Anyway, on to uh, something happier. Do you all remember um, Hat Mancock, Health Secretary, crying when the vaccine was rolled out? Do you remember right, he was on Good Morning Britain with Piers and he cried? He yeah. fake cried, psychopath, <laughs> over the <laughs> vaccine rollout. Do you not remember? Yes, yeah, yeah, said yeah. yes three times. Just simple words there, reacting it. You're quite emotional about that. Well, it's just, uh, it's been, you know, it's been such a tough year for so many people and there's William Shakespeare putting it so simply for everybody that, you know, we can get on with our lives and, and you know, there's still a few months to go. I've still got this worry that we can't blow it now, Piers. We've still got to get the vaccine to millions of people and so we've got to keep sticking by the rules but it's just you know there's so much work gone into this and i'm really really it makes you proud to be british so this asshole has has been the first to go on the media you know because the vaccine rollout has been seen as one of the positives in in our coronavirus fight yeah and uh matt hancock being health secretary has been the first to lap up the praise and try and get political points out of this well um dominic cummings was giving evidence oh, I thought you were... <laughs> to uh, a select committee this week and i think it kind yeah. of took the wind out of a mancock <laughs> sales here it, it's not coincidental that the vaccine program worked the way that it did um it's not coincidental that to do that we had to take it out of the, the department of health 
we had to have it authorised very directly by the Prime Minister and say, strip away all the normal nonsense that we can see is holding back funding in the... So we, we took it out of the Department of Health. Who, who was we? Well, in the sense that Number 10 took it out of the Department of Health back in... Back in. So in, in, spring, in spring 2020, you had a situation where... Department for Health was just a sort of smoking ruin in terms of procurement <laughs> and PPE and, uh, and, and all of that. Um, uh, you had serious problems with the funding bureaucracy for therapeutics on COVID. So that was the kind of context for it. Patrick Valence then came to Number 10 and said, this shouldn't be run out of the Department for Health. We should create a separate task force. We can't trust them with it, basically, because of the fuck-up of PPE. The smoking ruin, that is the Department of Health. Um, we also had the EU proposal, which uh, looked like um, uh, just an absolute guaranteed programme to fail debacle. <laughs> Uh, and therefore, Patrick Valence, the Cabinet Secretary, me and some others said, uh, obviously, we should take this out of the Department for Health. Obviously, we should create a separate task force. And obviously, we have to empower that task force directly with the authority of the Prime Minister. Yeah, that's, uh, I bet he was uh, cursing Dominic Cummings when he heard that. <laughs> yeah, just red tape. Absolutely. I mean, if, I can't imagine... He's wrong, Dominic Cummins, and saying that it, I can imagine him being a what did he call it? A skip fire or something? Yeah, a smoking ruin. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine most of Whitehall's like that. Yeah, most, most of the of time. The time. <laughs> <laughs> he mentioned the um, the EU um, vaccine procurement arrangement there. Now the EU have doubled down this week, haven't they? With the uh, pl- threatening to. Um, Ban exports? Yeah, looking yeah. after their own, this kind of saying, aren't they? Trying to. Yeah, they've threatened to halt exports that are manufactured from the EU going to the UK. Mm. And uh, Pfizer put out a statement this week, I don't know if you caught it, that... Um, anything from Pfizer. Uh, one of the main raw ingredients is for Pfizer's vaccine is manufactured, I think, in Hartlepool. Oh, right, so okay. if I said, uh, yeah, don't don't go down this road, mate, because you need the stuff from Hartlepool to make it in Germany. You mm. fucking dicks. <laughs> don't. What is it? What, what, what do they make in Hartlepool? It's some they sort of... It, tramps or something. It's some sort of, like, not gelatin, but it's something that carries some sort of fluid or whatever that carries the MR, MNRA. Okay. It's manufactured uh, it, somewhere on the East Coast, like Hartlepool, Doncaster, somewhere around there. Okay. Yeah, but they've doubled down, you know. They're, uh, the vaccine wars are upon us. Uh, well, they have, haven't they? They've been for a couple of weeks, vaccine wars, haven't they? Mm. They've said, yeah, we've we've said there's going to be a shortage as well, haven't we? And then what? we've just had two days in a row where I think we've had record yeah. vaccinations. 700,000 on Friday, 800 yesterday. That shortage was specifically AstraZeneca, wasn't it? Yeah. What was that down to? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe just to say to the EU, look, we can't we can't give you any because we're having a shortage coming to. Oh, like... Uh, it's part of this. <laughs> like the, the Villiers with the diamonds. Oh, there's a shortage yeah. of diamonds. Short are so market. scarce. Diamonds are so scarce. We've got vaults full of them. <laughs> but no, yeah, we don't have them really because, you know, it's a thousand pound a carrot. <laughs> Actually, we're, we're hoarding tons of it. That's a famous example, isn't it? Of um, what do they call it? Uh, artificial scarcity in the markets? Yeah, mm. Nintendo do that, don't they? How's that work? Well, they sell out immediately a new a new console, don't they? So you know, if there's less of them around, then you can charge more for them because it drives up demand. Mm-hmm. You mean the um, intentionally restrict manufacturing? Yeah. To in- to create scarcity. Yeah. So they just sell out immediately, don't they? Why like PS fives? Why not just sell? If they made more, could they not sell more? Um. Well, yeah, initially, but then it would die down, so you can draw it out. So what it, it what it creates is fever pitch. Oh, yeah. I can't get a PlayStation. You can't get a PlayStation. Oh, that yeah. sounds interesting. 
you can't get one. So it must, it must be, be good. good. Yeah. So it's hype. Yeah. Hype merchants of yeah. hype. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. If the EU were desperate for vaccine, I mean, they're already looking at, at um, approving Sputnik Five, aren't they? Oh, they? The Chinese all have loads of, of productivity, uh, loads of uh, manufacturing productivity for their vaccine, the Sinovac one. Would they not be, if it was a, well, I don't know the reasons for it, but um, whatever reason that is, would they not approach those countries for their vaccines? Well, some uh, European countries have done this unilaterally, haven't they? Some of the former Eastern Bloc countries, I believe, are using Sputnik mm -hmm. and maybe Sinovac. Maybe Czech, Czech Republic, Bulgaria, maybe. Right. I think they are using Sputnik. Now, you would think that they would be act as a group and they would all follow the EMA, wouldn't you? But I guess... Well, it doesn't, doesn't work, does it? It's proven not to work. They'll be looking over to the UK and going... Well, these guys are doing it on their own. Why can't we? Yeah. And then they can, and they do. And they vaccinate their population quicker than they would waiting for the for Ursula to sign the papers or whatever happens in the... Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see with different countries rolling out different technologies of vaccine what the sort of outcomes are going to be, isn't it? Because mm. I think the Sputnik and the Sinovac are traditional egg-based that's what I've heard, yeah. The, rather than yeah. the uh, the chimp, chimp DNA. Adenovirus. <laughs> the simian. Fucking nuts. <laughs> anyway. This would be, this would be quite uh, a conspiracy theory, wouldn't it, if China uh, released this virus and then um, it made every, the world's economy shrink their economy grows by 7% in the same year. They get rid of the virus within their own country. And then they sell the cure to the virus, the rest of the world. That would be a hell of a turnaround, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think the West on the whole is never going to accept no. uh, a Chinese or a Russian, even if it's just for face the face of it, the press. No, I think it's just face. I mean, will not surely do it. the vaccine works. Do you not think it probably works exactly the same? It has the same efficacy as the other ones. Lies, damn lies and statistics, mate. Do you not remember that graph oh. from the ONS? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The I argument, I think, against the, the kind of Eastern way of thinking is that has always been that the quality is not there, but I don't think that's the case anymore. To be perfectly frank, it depends. Like it, it depends. Like India has a really good reputation for sort of medical technology and stuff, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, China is more sort of secretive in that regard, and we probably don't have the same level of access to ascertain or judge where they are. But I mean, we all know the old maxim about cheap shit from China mm. and that's, well, that's stuck hasn't it and it's I, stuck and that's exactly. what I'm saying. I, I honestly don't think that's the case anymore um, for manufacturing certainly I, I can't speak for the virus but if, if now the do you, never, is, whoa, do you never buy anything from Amazon that was made in China and it just drops yeah, the dates well, <laughs> a lot of this crap is, uh, is from China um, that I have but none of it's broken yet Ugh. You've been blessed, I think. Well, no, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, Particularly electronics, yeah, they just fail. They're made to a price. I'll give you a good example: LED light bulbs. Right? Oh, yeah, they they pop all the time in my if you, house. If you buy Philips, uh, Sylvania, Osram, the dearer than mm. the cheap Chinese bulbs you get from Amazon, and the reason the dearer is you playing you're paying for that QC. The failure rate. Right. That's that's the whole reason. The the the, the quality control is far superior, and so you might get lucky with a Chinese mm -hmm. lamp, or you might not. It's it's same with guitars. Guitars is another example. You can get <laughs> really easy. good, really. You can get a really good two hundred quid guitar from China, and you can get a dog 
and you won't know till it turns up on the, from on the slow boat <laughs> from China. <laughs> no. No, you're right. Yeah, yeah, and the the dogs are rarer in uh, yeah in Japanese made and American made. Mm. Yeah, you're right because yeah because the QC and the handcraftiness. I, I just think it's it's probably better than it was. You know, in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, it could well be. Everything's better than the eighties, isn't it? Except, but, except well, yeah. What but was... if that's the case, then what's the what's the argument against? You know, rolling out Sputnik Five and and the sign because of, of the oversight, isn't it? Because we can't, we can't because of the secrets. Yeah, yeah and but the why we we have a lot of secrets, how, here, don't we? How long did it take uh, the Chinese Communist Party to let the WHO um, investigators in to look at the <laughs> the uh, after, after origins not, of the virus? After the a long uh, time, cut through all the time. weldings on the on the apartment <laughs> blocks doors. <laughs> I think the biggest conspiracy theory of this last year is that a bat flew a thousand miles to a seafood <laughs> market, then bit some other unknown animal, which then infected a human, rather than the the level four lab that was actually working on gain of function research in the same town. That's a conspiracy theory, if you believe that. It's how nonsense. Many times, how many times? Sorry, Ben, how many times when you left the um, whatever, level 10 lab that you were working in, did you forget to wash your hands? <laughs> oh, dear. Is that no, that's still oh, the, dear. the main thing? <laughs> oh, dear. He doesn't deny it straight off the bat. It's like Homer Simpson with the fucking bar of... of uh, plutonium. Plutonium, yeah. And his fucking lunchbox, whatever it is. <laughs> He, he was in that lab. He had one of those 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 nodding birds pressing a button on the desk. Yeah. Instead of a glass of water. Clown. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh God. You've got to have a laugh, haven't you? <sighs> yeah, I'm bored. I'm bored of coronavirus. We drum in the yeah, what are you gonna, around. Uh, it's, it's... What are you going to do when it's over? Just stick with the, the government mandated we propaganda. We messaging around the dangers of COVID pretty diligently for a full two week period of sustained propaganda. Yeah, let's move. Uh, let's should we move on? Something happier. I, I really enjoyed this this week. U.S. President Joe Biden has stumbled and fallen several times while running up the stairs of Air Force One. The 78-year-old gripped onto the railing as he tripped twice and fell over a third time when boarding the aircraft. He appears to take a moment to dust off his knee before making his way to the top. The White House says the president is just fine and did not require any attention from the medical team who travels with him. Did you see it? Yeah, it's awful, isn't it? Oh. Makes my skin crawl. Um, yeah. But it is really sore, isn't it, when you graze your shin like that? Oh, Absolutely. God, yeah. You catch it on that. On a but steel what step. Doing? What was he doing trying to run up all those steps? With Does he a, not know he's 100 years old? Well, with also, with a leather sole, because he's not wearing cheap plastic soles, is he? So he's got a oh, leather yeah. sole on a deep shag red car. Sorry? <laughs> It's just a, res- a recipe for disaster, but it's been shampooed. It's yeah, just going to yeah. slide. It's like butter, isn't it? <laughs> and it's just like that. <laughs> oh, slip. <laughs> slip. <laughs> slip again. Oh, God. Did you hear what the uh, Democratic Party spokes hole blamed it on? The, the deep shag? The wind. <laughs> <laughs> blamed it on the wind. Number 11. But it's so frail that the wind blew his legs from underneath him. <laughs> no more presidential appearances unless, <laughs> you know, months. if there's a greater than two mile an hour wind. <laughs> He's just fucked, isn't he? He should... Oh, God. They so, gave him a big shot in the ass and he thought, right, what? I can... I can a, big, a big what? <laughs> a big shot in the ass. Anal swap tasks for... <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear Putin's uh, witty reply? No. I can't remember. (laughs) There's been some fantastic memes, though. Yeah. Over it, like one where he's in the stairlift going up Air Force (laughs) One. There's one with uh, Kim Jong-un on the phone, and he's like, uh, 
You're not good. Me want Orange Man back <laughs> with Hot Wife. <laughs> it's weird. Um, I bet, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I bet it was. You know, it's just, you know, super painful. But... Mm, yeah. And you'd just be, imagine how, how thin his skin is as well. <laughs> It just like peel off his shin every time he did that. God, yeah. That bruise will never heal. No, it'd just be like a liver spot for the rest of his life. <laughs> as far as I know, he hasn't done a State of the Union address yet. He's fucked. He's not doing like interviews or anything. He's not He's talking. Not doing to anything. He's not being a president. He just flies around as a corpse. He's it's weak, weak. <laughs> weekend at Biden's. Yeah. <laughs> It's just, uh, yeah, Kamala's just got her hand up his ass. I think, just working him like a fucking puppet. Well, the thing he did that, didn't he, to George Bush Junior? Who? Cheney? Uh, yeah. Dick Cheney. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the, uh, the 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 story, wasn't it? Anyway. Yeah. It's what just... I was going to say, sorry, was how old is Trump? Is he seventy four or seventy five? 74, 74. Four years younger than him. Yeah, but he has had his skull removed twice. Who's, who? Biden, he's had brain <laughs> surgery. <neck. laughs> he's had uh, brain surgery twice. What for? Is this because his car accident? Was he in the car with the car accident? Oh, not that long ago. Not that long ago. He What's was in a car. That's, that's how he lost his first wife, I think, in a car accident. Yeah, I'm not sure if he was in the car though, but no, he's had brain surgery a couple of times in the last couple of decades. What for? I don't know. Just trying to find it, trying to see if there's anything in there. I think aneurysms, maybe or something. I don't know. I'm not that familiar with Joe Biden's medical history. I just know that his head's been opened. his head's been opened up <laughs> twice. I know that much. Right. So yeah. What's what's more disappointing was uh, than the fact that he's in office is that they couldn't find someone that they could back other than him. Yeah, for that's, the ticket. That's not how it works. Why well, he gets a tap on the shoulder? It's not about picking the best candidate. It's about picking who's gonna the most malleable do what we need done. Is that how our system works as well, then? Absolutely. It's like you said, Ben. They, as soon as you get made president, they take you into this room, and then, and then you, your clone walks in. <laughs> <laughs> Two to the head. Bang, bang. <laughs> They're all fucking puppets. It's just about... It's just fulfil the left-right paradigm, get people argue, arguing with each other, divide and conquer, political theatre. It's fucking nonsense. Don't give it your attention. Don't join the team. Don't be that guy who says we, we Democrats or us Republicans. Don't be that guy. You're being, you're being played. It's nonsense. That's my view on politics, anyway. Uh, should we stick with patriotism? I've only got a couple of little bits left, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the BBC were criticised um, after two breakfast presenters seemed to mock MP Robert Jenrick, who was on BBC Breakfast this week, and they were mocking him for having a union flag behind him and a picture of the Queen. It was uh, Charlie State and Nagamunchetti. Got the clip here. Let's listen to this. It's a bit peculiar. Robert Jenrick, uh, thank you. I think your uh, flag is not up to standard size uh, government interview uh, <laughs> measurements. I think it's just a... Naga loses her shit there. Loses all her composure and starts crying. A little bit small, but uh, that's your department, really. Was it, was it a really big flag? Is that what do we get? I don't know. Quite a big flag. I have a theory. Ooh. Just a thought. <laughs> The picture of the queen. The picture. You, uh, you'll, the picture you'll be aware that you'll be aware that every, every time we have, we we've seen it every day, haven't we? There's, it's, it's, it's a story. Always a flag. Thing, isn't it? it always there a flag. Have the picture of the queen there as well, though, in the Westminster office. I'm assuming. He starts justifying after that long awkward pause. He starts justifying why he's just made that comment, Charlie. And I have a theory. 
that, you know, journalists talk to each other and they find out things. We know people who've worked in journalism who know things about certain celebrity chefs, weird shit that they get up to that is under injunctions that no one is allowed to talk about it. Everyone knows about it in the journalism industry. All oh, right, yeah, but yeah. and certain other TV football pundits and whatnot. Mm. I think this is a little joke. I think it's well known in journalistic circles that Robert Jenrick has a mushroom cock, <laughs> and when he says makes that comment about the size of his flag, his flagpole, and Naga just loses her shit, completely loses her composure on live TV. I think that's what's going on there. It's a tiny penis. That's my deconstruction of that event. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> it's a theory. It's certainly there's a theory. There's some, there's some <laughs> circulating, do you think, in journalistic circles about him. What do we know about Liam Neeson? He's got a big bat. Willem Dafoe? A monster. <laughs> <laughs> A legit bat. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's uh, something going on about Robert Jenrick MP. That's my theory anyway. Well, one of our um, sometime producers says that Robin... What's he called? Robert. Is it Robin? Robert. Robert Robert Jenrick. Um, He's like peak crony (laughs) for the Conservative Party and just like, you know, hands out massive million millions upon millions of contracts to his mates allegedly yeah yeah Mm. Mm. there's a lot of that goes on Mm. i do have some some cronyism actually that was sent to us by a producer i don't know if you want to do it we're we're rocking up to 10 o'clock already um, um, it's actually t- 20 past 10, but... Is it? Yeah, go on. Seven minutes past, mine says. Mm. Am I wrong? Time dilation. Yeah. Fuck, I'm wrong. All right, just a quickie then. Mm-hmm. This is from The Guardian on Friday. Have you heard about the NTP, the National Tutoring Programme? No. Mm. So this is a, something that's been set up and pumped with millions and hundreds of millions of pounds to help disadvantaged children catch up with their homeschooling and their learning. UK tutoring scheme uses under 18s in Sri Lanka paid as little as £1.57 an hour. (laughs) Tutors in Sri Sri Lanka who are as young as 17 and earning as little as £1.57 an hour have been used by the government's flagship national tutoring programme to teach maths to disadvantaged primary school children in England, the Guardian has learned. The the Department of Education announced the immediate suspension of the use of under-18s as tutors for the £350 million national tutoring programme, NTP. After being approached about the revelations and pledged a review of the use of overseas-based tutors in the coming year. Critics condemned another example of the government outsourcing support and services in its pandemic response and said the funding, which is part of a £1.7 billion catch-up fund announced last year, should have gone directly to schools to source their own tutors rather than through a complex system of private companies. Mates. They've disregarded any teachers over here who could do it, UK-based online tutors. Well, because imagine how much you can skim off one pound fifty-seven uh, um, against twenty pound an hour. Sri- the Sri Lanka-based tutors were provided through Third Space Learning (TSL), one of thirty-three tuition providers approved by the NTP to deliver one-to-one small group tuition. Research by the Guardian revealed that TSL, which works with one tutor centre in Sri Lanka as well as two partner centres in India, had a minimum minimum age requirement of seventeen with pay per tuition session as low as 500 sorry 425 Sri Lankan rupees the equivalent of 1 pound 57 rising to an average of 3 pound 07 uh, TSL founder and chief executive Tom Hooper said using tutors in India and Sri Lanka is part of the solution to try and make tutoring more accessible to children from disadvantaged backgrounds they they are all stem science technology engineering and maths graduates 
and receive training and ongoing professional development which is overseen by our UK-based team of teachers. According to Hooper, every TSL session for the National Tutoring Programme costs £18.33, <laughs> <For fuck's sake. laughs> £9.50 of which pays for programme design, customer support, technology and finance in its London office, with £5.36 for tutor training and development at the Colombo office. <laughs> Fucking joke, this. Uh, Colombo office and on three pounds seven pence per tutor per session. Hooper said the company makes two percent profit on each NTP session. Bollocks, bollocks. Yeah, I don't think they're doing it out of the goodness of the heart. Are they? Are they? Fuck no. Salchin eats in. If you want to steal big, <laughs> steal from the state. Yeah, online chemistry tutor sorts this, and the you know. We want people are calling for inquiries. There's people, uh, heads of teachers' unions, saying, "What the fuck's all this about?" Mm. Yeah. It's just wrong, is it? It's so wrong. Why? Well, How yeah, do you think I... they get away with it? Because it's just mates, isn't it? It's mates. It's a crisis, mate. We just had to. We just had to spend it, mate. It's the oversight. We're, we're lacking oversight. All this thing. All this will come out in the wash, hopefully. Um. There's one other, um, one other uh, COVID-related thing that I'm tracking, which I wanted to bring to attention. Oh, and it was something Mary mentioned very briefly, actually. Now this is from the BBC, 11th of February. Story: uh, Disabled people account for six in ten deaths in England last year. Nearly six out of every ten people who died with coronavirus in England last year were disabled. Figures suggest. Some 30,296 of the 50,888 deaths between January and November were people with a disability. Office for the National Statistics data shows. I don't know how trustworthy that data is from ONS based on our co on podcast tonight, but whatever. It also suggests the risk of death is three times greater for more severely disabled people. Charities have called for urgent government action describing the data as horrifying and tragic. The ONS figures suggest disabled people were disproportionately affected by the pe pandemic, accounting for 17.2% of the study population, but nearly 60% of coronavirus deaths. Looking at people with a medically diagnosed learning disability, the risk of death involving COVID was 3.7 times greater for both men and women compared to people who didn't have a learning disability. I wouldn't like dyslexia count as a learning, a, a diagnosable learning disability. I don't know. Like, yeah, he probably would. Now, I've, I've been tracking this for a while, for a few weeks now. That was February, BBC uh, 11th of February. Now, two days later in The Guardian. So that's disabled people disproportionately being victims, deaths of COVID. 13th of February, Guardian. Fury at do not resuscitate gnosis given to COVID patients with learning disabilities. Can we see a connection there? Vulnerable people may have encountered shocking discrimination during the pandemic, says Mencap, the charity. People with learning disabilities have been given do not resuscitate orders during the second wave of the pandemic in spite of widespread condemnation of the practice last year and an urgent investigation by, care, by the care watchdog. Mencap, Mencap said it received reports in January from people with learning disabilities that they had been told they wouldn't be resuscitated if they were taken ill with COVID. <coughs> Care Quality Commission said in December that inappropriate, inappropriate, do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation notices had caused potentially avoidable deaths last year. DNA CPRs are usually made for people who are too frail to benefit from CPR, but Mencap said some seem to have been issued for people simply because they had learning disabilities. This is uh, disturbing. Very. Um, fuck me. That's 13th of February. Fast forward, 18th of March. So this is this week in The Guardian. Blanket do not resuscitate order orders imposed on English care homes, finds the quality Care Quality Commission. So doing it in care homes now as well. They have been since the start of the pandemic. 
Regulator finds disturbing inconsistencies, including orders being applied to everyone over 80 with dementia in one residence. Uh, concerns have been raised about blanket DNA CPR orders being put in place and being recorded on patients' records without discussion or informed consent. Blah de blah de blah. Um, the uh, CQC has done a report. Uh, the report is called Protect, Respect, Connect uh, Decisions About Living and Dying Well During COVID 19. Um, the report calls for a ministerial oversight group working with partners in health and social care, local government, and the voluntary sector to take responsibility for delivering improvements in this area. The report surveyed a range of individuals and organisations, including care providers and members of the public, and in identified five bullet point problems. Number one, serious concerns about breaches of some individuals' human rights. Two, significant increase in DNA CPRs put in place in care homes at the beginning of the pandemic. Three, 119 adult social care providers felt they'd been subject to blanket DNA CPRs decisions since the start of the pandemic. Four, a GP, set, a GP sent DNA CPR letters to care homes asking them to put blanket do not resuscitate orders in place. And last one, in one care home, a blanket do not resuscitate order was applied to everyone over 80 with dementia. And this is the kicker. Healthcare professionals emphasise that resuscitation is both invasive and traumatic, with only a 15 to 20 percent survival rate when performed in hospitals, and a 5 to 10 percent success rate when performed outside hospitals. What's the survival rate if you don't attempt CPR? Zero. Zero. So I'm expecting to see more on this in the public inquiry when it comes in three, four, five years. This is really worrying. And uh, it's starting to get some some uh, traction in the mainstream, but especially the learning difficulties thing. Fuck me, what are we doing? We're supposed to be an enlightened Western democracy who treat people with human rights. We're putting blanket do not resuscitate orders on people with learning difficulties. Seriously. Folks. Is this because they thought some massive wave was coming and they put these out before it hit? Damn. Whatever it is, there's no fucking excuse for it. Oh. And uh, Yeah, anyway, I don't want to finish on that downer. I've got one more clip. Um, you know what my favourite podcast is? Um, this one? No Agenda. No Machine Inquisition. No, I'm Ish Matt's right. It's the No Agenda podcast. Uh, and they've been going for nearly 14 years now, playing clips uh, every week. And they save everything. They have a massive battery of clips that they've collected over the years. And um, they've not had a week off. They do two shows a week. They've not had a week off since the pandemic started because there's been that much to cover. And so what happens is when, they, when they're going to have a break, they pre-prepare an episode to put out there's always something that comes out every Thursday, every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So um, what they were doing, uh, the Adams co-host, John Dvorak, was going through some of their old climate change clips, looking for stuff they could find to, to use in one of these, like, because they're planning a holiday. They, they need a break. They're fucked, basically. <laughs> and um, he found this um, clip, and it was just too good not to, to share with you. It's a, a climate scientist. I think it's from, it's only from a couple of years ago, I think talking about the climate emergency but it's it's just beautiful geologic history and even if the contribution we're making is just the one straw that breaks the camel's back isn't that enough to get you to want to curtail our behavior i think that's actually a really good question i'm glad you asked it um because people keep telling climate scientists like oh the climate's always changed and we're like we know we told you that we are essentially the people who study that we figured that out what percentage of the warming right now are humans responsible for over a hundred percent. Over a hundred percent. Jesus Christmas. Wow. That's a legit climate scientist for you there. Wow. Obviously didn't obviously flunk maths. <laughs> oh dear. 
Was that Alec, Alec Baldwin? It does sound podcast. like Alec. I thought it was Alec Baldwin. I'm not sure. He does have a podcast. Yeah, maybe it was. So it was, wasn't it? I yeah. think. Uh, anything to add before we fuck off into the night? Uh, no, just oh, ready for bed. It. Yeah. Very good then. Well, uh, I've no idea who we've got next week. If I've shit the bed again, I usually write Chris down. Newby. Oh, yeah. He's, he's new and he's crisp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish we could what vaccinate against stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll find out. Right, should we go? Yes. See you later. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yeah. And the Odyssey Leave channel. Leave us a review. How are you doing, Matt? I just look checking it was Chris Newby. It is. <laughs> All right. Good. Just read the standing order, will you? Read the standing orders. Read them and understand them. Uh, toss, toss the Elysium, mum. Because I'm literally a communist. She doesn't give one shit. There's more from Dick Pound. <laughs> I got Harry. Crunch. Because I'm literally a. Oh. Because we're getting bored and we want to have fun. Chest feeding. <laughs> you have no authority here, Jackie Weaver. Hey, man. And a woman. I can't have children with a whore. Uh, toss, toss the Elysium, mum. I can't save you if you're not wearing a face mask.